Okay. Um. How about drive? Let's try that. Like a lazy cat, you stretched your arms above your head and yawned, blinking your eyes sleepily. The day was warm and pleasant, and you were lounging on the couch in the living room, finding it difficult to do much in that moment. Your moms and Liz had gone out shopping, looking for some new items for your sister to take back and decorate her college dorm with. They had asked if you wanted to go with them, but you declined. For you, today was all about relaxation. Cove had dropped by to spend some time with you, content to join in with doing nothing. The two of you had been chatting idly as you lazed around, talking about the other things that you had planned for the summer. You were sitting next to him, he sat on one couch while you sat on your own, he sat on one couch while you were fully stretched out on the other, you were stretched out across him as he sat on the couch, you were cuddling on the couch. Um, I would be stretched out across him as he sat on the couch. Yeah. You had your feet propped up on one of the armrests and used Cove as a comfy cushion beneath your head. Totally settled in. That would probably be my favorite position, just in general. I mean, I love cuddling, don't get me wrong. Love cuddling, but if we're just like hanging out, my default would probably be that. Cove gently wound his fingers through his your hair as you rested on his legs. Quick, equally to ease. See, it's those little things. Little things like that, that are just mwah. So comforting, so comfortable. It makes you feel so safe. The day dragged on, and you found yourself yawning more and more often between conversations. You had almost dozed off completely when suddenly a buzz rang out, disturbing the silence. Your phone was on its charger in the kitchen, so it couldn't have been that. Cove pulled his own phone from his back pocket and checked the screen. His movement had jostled you, so you tried to readjust your positions to get it right again. Oh. Your position right again. It's my mom. After leaning forward and setting the phone on the coffee table in front of him, Cove hit the speaker button. Hey, what's up? Vaughn is here too. Hi. Hi, Cove. Hello, Vaughn. Oh, look at her hair. I like her hair. You made a small noise through a pause. Hi. Kyra. Hey, Mom3. You're interrupting our very important do nothing you, nothing time you know. I hope you're not interrupting. I hope you know you're interrupting our cuddle time. I'll say, hey, Mom3. You knew your forwardness was making Cove regret putting it on speaker, but you were all right with that. Cove, baby, I wanted to ask if you have a plan for all your junk. Cove made a small, outraged grumble, giving you a sidelong glance. It's not, that's not junk, it's, Im it's important. Mm-hmm. Though you couldn't see it, you could tell by the sound of her voice that Cairo was smiling. Uh -huh. But is that a yes or a no about the plan? He looked over at you, his mouth pulled into a tight smile. I'm still thinking about it. Um, Vaughn? I'm gonna take the phone off speaker so me and mom can go over this. It'll be quick. Cove carefully moved you off him and took the phone from the table before pushing himself to his feet. He hit the speaker button again to turn it off and continued the conversation with his mom as he headed towards the door. The lock clicked behind him as he exited the house and you sank back into the cushions, idly trying to decide what to do next. After electing to grab your phone from its charger, you resumed your position on the couch, tapping away at the screen. Your mind drifted away from thoughts of Cove and his phone call with all the many ways your device could distract you. It was an effective enough way to kill ta the time, and you had managed to do various little things when the door opened again and Cove returned. He gave you a smile as he approached, so you figured the conversation couldn't have gone too bad. You watched as Cove strolled over to where you were still sitting. He crossed his arms against the top corner of the couch, resting on them while bending forward to lightly kiss the top of your head. Hey! I'm back! You gazed up at him fondly. You put a hand over his. You stretched up to hold his face. You tilted your head and gave him a small kiss. You met your lips. He met your lips with his, closing his eyes and letting you kiss him longer than the other, than the one he had just given prior. Is everything okay? That's... Everything's fine, just... He turned his head subtly, running a hand through his hair and letting out an exasperated breath. He seemed nervous, but you couldn't imagine why. Fine. It's fine. No, not, not anything to worry about. You raise an eyebrow at his tone, moving your head to the side to try and meet his eye. That doesn't explain what's going on. He shrugged and gave you a tight smile, trying to play whatever it actually was off as, impor as unimportant. There's nothing going on, just stuff I can deal with later, some other time. <laughs> it's a tomorrow problem. That's what my sister-in-law likes to say, this is a tomorrow problem. And 
I'm the kind of person who um, doesn't like to put aside for tomorrow what I could get done today. Again, I'm not a procrastinator. Very much am terrible at procrastinating in the sense that I don't. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it's nice to be able to say, that's a tomorrow problem. And I do that on occasion more often now than I had before, mostly because of people like my sister-in-law who are just saying, you could do that tomorrow or you could do something meaningfully fun and relaxing today because sometimes you deserve it. So, you know, uh, and so I'll still do that even if doing something tomorrow still means that I'm doing it weeks in advance anyway. So what's another day if I'm still going to be ahead of the schedule? That's, that's, that's the compromise there. That is the compromise. He eventually he took, he broke beneath your stair, hanging his head in his hands and groaning. Mm -hmm. I need to make another trip to my mom's place. There's some stuff out there that I'm going to use, so I'll have to go pick it up. See, this is actually what I'm living right now. So I just, I just bought my first house ever. My husband and I bought our first house ever, excuse me. And um, I, if we have a really large space, which I love because we're trying to get make it, uh, prepare it for our new child, our new daughter that's coming in October of 2021. Um, so that's exciting. And meanwhile, my parents just sold their house here in this area and they had another house in Florida which so they were snowboarding snowboarding snowbirding snowbirding as in for those of you who don't know what that means it means that um, you have a house in a warmer part of the country and another house in another part of the country such that when it's cold in this area they fly over to Florida and stay at Florida while it's where it's warm. And then when things warm back up here, where we live, they fly back, which is what you can do when you have multiple houses in two different, in two different places. So that's snow burning. And um, they did that for a number of years, but now they finally sold their house here. And a whole bunch of my stuff was still at my parents' house in storage because I, sure, I think to a degree I'm a bit of a pack rat. I don't think I'm nearly as bad as many people who would be described as a pack rat because I do throw things away. I do evaluate on a reg relatively regular basis, okay, is this something I actually need or can I live without this? And so I'm trying to... I. I'm the kind of person who gets very sentimental about things and I have, there's just certain things that just have a bit of a sentimental value for me. And it's it's like when you hold it in your hands and when you pick it up or if you're going through it amongst your things, you know, when you're like cleaning out an attic or cleaning out the garage and you find something that you just forgot about and you're like, I remember this. And then it just takes you back. It like transports you back to a moment in time and you're like, I miss those days. See, those are the type of things that I like to hold on to because it just nostalgically transports me back. And I know like one of the things that people can do to prevent the pack ratness is take photos of things. Like if there's a, a, a an outfit or a shirt or something that is really meaningful to you or an object that's really meaningful to you, you could just take a picture of it and then throw it away. Um, and I do that with a lot of my things, but sometimes I just, there's just something about having the physical object that just makes me, mm, it just gives me warm fuzzies. And those kind of things are just priceless. Like those are things are, are irreplaceable. But I also try to be, realistic about it. I try to be reasonable about more reasonable about it because if I kept every single object that gave me f warm fuzzies all the time, it would it's just not sustainable. It's just really not sustainable and it's not realistic. So I try to pick and choose and little by little I'll whittle things away 
So whittle things down so that, all right, I have this object that is really, really important to me and the memory associated with this object carries way more weight than this other object that I'm not gonna miss as much as the other and this one takes up more space. This one takes up more space, so more bang for my buck if I can get rid of it or at least take a photo of it and then get rid of it and still have a photo at least to remember it by. Um, so I know Cove's feeling and um, yeah, I mean, trust me, it's a great feeling too to be able to clean out a bunch of things and just allow for more breathing room and space. Because um, I'm trying to, again, be very, to be better about how attached I am to sentimental objects. Um, so it's a, it's a balance. You try, to, you try to have a realistic balance. Um, for your situation, your living situation, your storage situation. It wouldn't make sense to ship it, and I couldn't bring the stuff back with me last time since I flew. Oh, suddenly you understood what the phone conversation had been about. Cole was going to drive his mom's house, to his mom's house in Nevada. Ah, gotcha. So my parents actually um, rented U-boxes, I didn't even know what this was before either, but a Ryu box is something that you can rent to be placed at your house to store things in temporarily and then transport the U box to another location. And many people use this to move, like as another option of moving things versus a truck. Because a truck, a U-Haul truck, you physically are the one that's supposed to be driving it to and fro, whereas a Ryu box, you can just send it. You'll just pack it up, and then tell the U-Haul U-Box people to drive it over for you while you get onto a plane or whatever form of transportation to get to your new house or wherever it is you're shipping everything to. So that's what they did. Um, this is like back in a, in a day where that probably wasn't as much of an option, or even if it was an option, I don't know if it's within Kyra's price range, this is certainly probably going to be cheaper but not as convenient. But it also means we get to visit Kyra and see her and have a scene about it, a moment scene about it. When will you go? Mom thinks it would be best to do it now while well, I'm still kind of free, but Cow Cove pouted, giving you an unhappy look, and you could see the prospect was already taking a toll on him. He wants me to come with him because he doesn't want to go by himself, which I totally get. I'd be the same way too. <sighs> I don't want to. I was just there and, he and for even longer than usual. Why do I have to leave, right now, when it's our last summer like this? I agree. You laughed at knowing why he was being so difficult about it. You thought it was cute and you want, cute he wanted to stay. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I would feel the same way too. It'd be like, ah, I have to drive all the way. Remember that I'm not a person who, who enjoys driving long distances. You know, I driving for me is, is not a pleasurable activity. I do it out of necessity. I don't live to drive. I guess. I live to eat, but I don't live to drive. Uh, and as I said before, um, road trips are not my thing. They're, I do not find anything appealing about traveling around by car for long periods of time just to see various things. Because um, normally, I get it because you can like see multiple things along the way. It's all about the journey, not the destination. I'm not, but that's not for me. You know, I want to go to a specific place and I will fly there if it takes more than like five hours to drive to, four or five hours to drive to. Um, I will fly there and enjoy the destination once I get to the destination and then I'll fly back and not have to worry about being stuck in a car. Now granted, being stuck in a car for eight hours versus you know, flying around and transferring flights in an airport when I'm going to like the Philippines, because Philippines is basically a 24 hour ordeal, which includes like 16 hours of being on a plane at least, or something like that, something ridiculous like that. 16 hours total on a plane, plus all the time in between for transfers. That of course is more stressful than just being in a car for eight hours and being able to like stretch and go to like rest stops and maybe eat out at a nice restaurant in between or even 
stop over at a hotel or a motel. Yes, that's easier, but I'm not going to the Philippines like that often. So yeah, in general, not a fan of driving. Totally get what Cove is saying. I can definitely relate. You can hack it. I don't want you to go either. You shook your head affectionately. Uh, I don't want you to go. I don't want to say this either. You shook your head affectionately. Uh, you thought it was cute you wanted to stay. I'll just say you shook your head affectionately. He was always dramatic. No, that's not, that's not, that's not what I would, no, I don't, I don't, no, I don't want that. Um, you thought it was cute he wanted to say. It showed how much he appreciated being there and spending time with you. Looking up again, you met his bright aquamarine eyes, finding a sad smile tugging on his lips. Oh. Oh. Suddenly his eyebrows jumped and his eyes lit up like a lamp. You could come with me. I mean, that's what I was going to suggest. What? You should come with me. I mean, I get that the two of us live next door to each other and my mom lives in another state. My trips there are usually to spend time with her, just the two of us. But this time, it won't be like that. All I'm going to do is drive over, stay for a night, and then pack up the car in the morning and turn around again. Most of the time, we'll be spent in the car, so it'd be good to have another person there. Yeah, I can relate. If I'm going to be driving that many hours, having one, having somebody come with me is pretty key. Pretty clutch. Especially because if I, if I admit it, another reason that I don't like driving long distances is, which is more of a practical reason, is I, it's, I fall asleep, like, in cars, in moving cars, very easily. Now, granted, I've never been in a situation where that obviously got really dangerous. Like, I would, you know, pull over and just maybe even do, maybe do a power nap. I would pull over and do a power nap if I really was having trouble. But yeah, if I'm driving for more than two and a half, three hours, more than that, that's a bit of a struggle without Red Bull or something that's really like there to keep me awake. You know, I'm try I try to like blare out upbeat music to keep me awake, but that can only do that for a, for a limited amount of time. So that's the thing, it's just something about me. It's, it's, it's very easy for me to fall asleep in the car and my husband gets annoyed by that because he loves Ch talking and catching up <laughs> and just you know just discussing things when we have our long drives to say to see our family in New York for example because he has family in New York so that's like the big long drive that we do on a regular basis is to go visit his family there and that's when he really likes to like chat and talk and for me there's been many occasions where he's in the middle of a conversation and he's talking to me about something and then I like He'll, he'll finish a sentence and waiting for me to respond and I'm like I'm like asleep and then I feel so bad because I'm not doing it on purpose like I want to be I want to show that I am engaged and interested in what he's saying but the lull and the movement of the car just is too overpowering and I just fall asleep even if what he's saying is perfectly like interesting and perfectly engaging so practical reason why I don't like driving long distances at least especially if it's by myself that would be like I would be terrified I would be very very terrified having to drive by myself for eight hours that would be not fun at all I would hate it so much plus you'd have the chance to meet my to see my mom again and her place maybe we could even find something cool to break at to break at on the way yeah that's what i would like to do breaks breaks are good for long distances you couldn't stop yourself from laughing at his enthusiasm he blushed a little reining himself in please i just feel like it could be fun please could you think about it i want to go a road trip sounds fun i love how like i don't even get a choice they're like you pick driving doesn't matter what you actually think we are railroading you to go driving with, with, with Cove. So I'll have to let my moms know, but as long as we're, we got nothing else important on the days we pick, then there's no reason I wouldn't be able to go. He grinned from ear to ear, thrilled by the news. He put both his hands on your cheeks, kissing your face all over. Then he wrapped his arms around your neck, letting out a happy sigh. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. This is so great. I'll call my mom back and let her know right now. You spent some time together going over your schedules and making plans for when you could take the trip. 
he needed to fit it around Cove's work schedule, which he brought up on his phone to double check, because I'm not working. Luckily, it was only a two-day trip, so finding a couple free days in a row wasn't impossible. It wasn't long before the dates were finally set and all the plans were made. You were excited for this trip. You were content with the plans. You were nervous. You were feeling unsure about everything. I mean, I'm content. I mean, yeah, I get to just hang out with Cove. But I feel like I always hang out with Cove, which is fine. I don't mind hanging more time with him. But, you know, I wouldn't say I'm excited. I would say because it's such a long drive, and I don't like driving, or even if somebody else is driving, I just prefer to go by car. I mean, to prefer to go by plane if it's going to be more than X number of hours. So, I'm content. It would be a good chance for you to get out and see more of the country, and it wasn't much of an inconvenience. It is for me. No matter what you thought about things, the morning when you were due to leave arrived. It was cooler than usual, the sun barely peeking over the tops of the houses. You stood outside your house on the footpath near the door waiting for Cove. You were feeling refreshed after a good night's sleep and an early wake up. With your travel bag clutched in one hand, you, you watched as Cove finished packing up his car. He had organized all sorts of things, water bottles, snacks, and who knows what else. Cove insisted he had everything under control and didn't need help. At least you could rest easy knowing that it was all taken care of. As you waited, you glanced over Cove's car. You knew it well. It used to belong to Mr. Holden, and when Cove had learned how to, how to, learn to drive, it passed to him. His dad had taken the opportunity to get a newer one. It was pretty old at this point, but had served both, them, both of them well so far. You just hoped it had enough life in it to survive a trip as long as the one you were embarking on. The slam of the door closing made you jump. You snapped back to focus and saw Cove was walking towards you. He dusted his hands off on his pants and tilted his head towards the car. That's it. Ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. He smiled and stepped aside, giving you space to situate your own bag where you wanted it. Once everything was safely inside, he glanced back at you. All right. We should get started. It's going to be a ways to go. Woo. You gave him a, you gave him a high five. You hugged him. You smiled back with a nod. I'd be like, <laughs> The two of you climbed into the car and buckled up, Cove in the driver's seat and you sitting shotgun. His eyes moved to you. Thank you. Thanks again for coming on this trip with me. Gotta do it in order to like help you out, because I would I would want him to do this for me if I asked, if I was in the situation. Of course, it's no problem. After checking the mirrors and starting the engine, you pulled out of the driveway and the trip began. With a small sigh, you got cozy in your seat and watched the familiar houses in your neighborhood pass by. Cove reached over to turn on the radio. Yes! That, for me, would be the best part of the trip, would just be like busting out in tunes while driving. Uh, a crackle of static mixed with the old snippets of song filled the car as they flipped through the stations. Mr. Holden's car was in good condition, but it was, well, older. There was no way to plug in a phone to play music, so the radio had to go. And the car looks a lot like Kyra's car, and our mom's car, and Baxter's car, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how they reuse all the car interior, car interiors for these. Eventually settled on top 40 station before sitting back and resting both hands on the wheel. Is this okay? Yeah, I, you know what I like. Yeah, it works. You nodded. Can I change it? I'd rather have it off. Top 40s, that, that's like my jam too. Yes, you know what I like. How could I forget? He smiled, happy with the answer. Time flew by and with it, this, and with it the scenery outside your window became more and more unfamiliar. Neither of you spoke for a good long while, but the quiet was, was comfortable. This is the point where I would fall right to sleep. You had become all too used to each other's company over the years. Eventually, Cove broke the silence, clearing his throat softly before he spoke. It's been too long since you and I have spent time with my mom. I know she still comes to the neighborhood sometimes, but it's not even once a year. I'm always going to, I'm always going to hers. I'm happy the two of us are doing this. Yeah, me too. But speaking of your mom and trips, remember the time she took us on that crazy drive all across town? Yeah, I did. He shook his head at the memory, his laughter clear and bright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember. I kept worrying about papers and shoes while you were having a while you were having a blast. Not at the movie. It was an amazing night. I wonder what I was thinking. Sheesh, I was dumb. I wonder what I was thinking. That was really was over the top. He smiled quietly to himself, clutching the wheel a little more confidently. With the crinkling of his eyebrows, a look of nostalgia crossed over Cove's features. <sighs> Mom always knew how to make things memorable. 
I can't deny that. Silence slowly crept back into the space, both of you thinking back on that night and all the memories you had of it. Your elbow resting on the windowsill, you gaze out at a world that was slowly coming to life as the morning rolled on by. The sun climbed higher in the sky. Luckily, the sunbeams weren't going right in your eyes. Hey, do you mind reaching back for me? Cove gave you a sidelong glance as he drove, indicating with a nod of his head and a tiny smile. I want some chips, the salt and vinegar ones. That's a great flavor. I don't know how you can eat that. You didn't have to comment on the selection. Sal salt and vinegar is one of my favorites. Definitely one of my top favorite chip. Right? Right. Eat whatever you want to. I brought a bunch of everything. Stretching out the seatbelt to give yourself space, you twisted in your spot and reached into the bag holding the snacks. It took a bit of effort to sort through the collection of goodies stuffed inside, but eventually the bag of chips crinkled beneath your fingers as you pulled them out and sat back in your seat. Here. Thanks, do you mind opening it? His eyes lit up at the prospects of the snacks and he shook your head in amusement, popping the top of the bag. You poured a few chips into his hand, you held the bag open towards him. Want me to feed them to you? That's what I would say. His eyes widened, a hint of blush creeping over his cheeks, but he steadfastly continued to face the road. I, uh... Uh, no, that's okay. Well, I just offered. Can you just pour a few into my hand? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Cove held out one outstretched hand. You did your best to have the ships fall into his palm, but some did end up on the floor. This is why I offered to feed him. After that, you rolled up the top of the bag and stowed the chips safely in the back again. I'm very particular about... about keeping my car clean and eating in cars. I do eat in my car, but um, I, I, only, I try to only do that when I absolutely need to, if it's a necessity. Um, I wouldn't like casually do it. After that, you rolled up the top of the bag and stowed the chips safely in the back again. When you turned to the front, it was, hard, it was to find Cove, crushing the fistful of chips into his mouth and crunching loudly. He wiped his hands on his pants absentmindedly before gripping the wheel and spilling crumbs all over the place. You're a little kid. You're like a little kid. You laughed at that. How can you eat that much at once? <laughs> I wouldn't be saying that. I eat a lot too. I'm impressed. You had no reaction to that. You laughed at that. You couldn't help stop. You couldn't stop the amused sound that escaped you. And when Quove, Quove raised a questioning eyebrow, you simply shook your head. The hours drifted by in much the same way as that, with the two of you snacking and chatting as the day stretched on. It was a fairly calm and quiet traveling along the open road, and you found little in the way of interruptions. At one point, you passed a Welcome Nevada to Nevada sign, and Cove gave a tiny cheer. He was in disbelief that the two of you were seriously all the way in another state like this. Eventually, you had to stop for gas and made a detour at a small diner to grab a proper meal that didn't consist of chips and candy. Yeah, I would insist that we had a proper meal on the way. After refueling both the car and your stomachs, the, driver's, the drive was back on, just as the sun began dipping beneath the horizon and bathing the sky in a wash of orange light. Cove informed you that there wasn't too much longer left to go. You were almost there. You took shifts during throughout, throughout your trip. You helped Cove stay alert while he drove. I mean, t we would, I would offer to do shifts. I would. You took shifts. The route was fairly straightforward and you'd had enough practice with driving to feel comfortable doing so. When night eventually fell in a blanket of darkness, the drive finally came to an end. Cove pulled into the parking lot of Kyra's apartment building, the glow of the car lights disappearing as he turned off the engine and let out a heavy sigh. Huh. We made it. We're here. The two of you exchanged tired smiles, having successfully and safely completed one half of the trip. You were relieved to have actually arrived and eager to get out of the car and stretch your legs. You took the stairs up the building together. After a knock, you were abruptly met by a flash of green hair as Kyra opened the door and immediately took her son in her arms. Cole. There he is, my gigantic baby boy. Ooh, I like her place. I'm digging those blue pillows there. That's a cool color. She squeezed him for a moment and pulled back so he could examine his face. And you, are you even taller than the last time I saw you? Ko gave her a fond look as he as she patted the tops of his shoulders proudly. You say that every time I'm here. It doesn't make even make sense right now. My last visit wasn't that long ago. Kyra simply laughed before letting him go fully and ushering the two of you into her apartment. Then she turned to you, a wide grin pulling at her lips. 